Hey guys, welcome back to Medicine Deconstructed. I'm your host, Dr. Jay Rutland. I really appreciate you guys being here today. Please hit that subscription button, hit that notification button, and I'll see you every Tuesday. In the madness that is SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19, one of the most important lessons is immunology and immunity. What is immunity? What is herd immunity? Can we become lifelong immune to SARS-CoV-2? You're gonna learn about that and more on today's episode. So the first thing, what is immunity? Well, immunity is the resistance of an organism to our particular infection or toxin due to either sensitized white blood cells or antibodies. The immune system consists of white blood cells that have particular jobs to do. The white blood cells include neutrophils, basophils, mast cells, eosinophils, macrophages. Okay, these are like your innate immune system. These are the cells that are first on the scene. After that, you start to develop different types of cells that come to the scene. Other cells include dendritic cells. These cells are important in seeing what a pathogen looks like and presenting this protein to other white blood cells so that antibodies can be made. B cells are the type of white blood cells that make antibodies. Then there's T cells. And then there are NK cells, NKT cells. There's so many different types of white blood cells and they all have different jobs to do. Antibodies are proteins that can recognize foreign objects by floating around in the bloodstream. When you think about the antibodies in your body, that includes IgA, IgM, IgG, IgD, no one knows what that does, and IgE. So there are many different types of antibodies. The most abundant antibody in your system is probably IgG. So IgG floats around in your bloodstream looking for things that are abnormal and will bind to these things. There's also another component of the immune system called the complement system. They're like little balls that get distributed in the bloodstream will bind to certain pathogens. And as they bind to certain pathogens, they're essentially marking the pathogen. Like paintball, when you're playing paintball and you mark somebody and you fire, you get that paint all over them. They look unusual now and abnormal and you're kind of warning people. That's the same thing that complement system does. So all of these cells, all of these proteins work together to create immunity. You guys have all seen these crazy headlines. Antibody levels over the course of time go down to zero, so we're not gonna be able to create a vaccine. Or immunity to SARS-CoV-2 isn't gonna happen because antibody levels go to zero. <laughs> yeah, okay. Here's the thing about immunity. What did I just tell you? I told you the definition. It not only included antibodies, but sensitized white blood cells. The sensitized white blood cells are those T cells. Those are cells that originate and develop within the thymus, which is an organ that develops until we're about 13 or 14 years old. Within the thymus, the T cells, whose job is to recognize what cells are infected or what pathogens are present in the bloodstream that shouldn't be there, they undergo kind of a tolerance exercise. We don't want the T cells to react too much to our own body, but we also want them to react to foreign substances. If they react too much, they're killed off. If they don't react enough, they're killed off. If they react perfectly, they get to move on. B cells are cells that are developed in your bone marrow, and their job is to not only recognize pathogen or recognize antigen, but it's also to have cells produce antibodies. If you're in your body and you continue to make proteins, which are antibodies, right? Your blood's gonna become really thick if you make a lot of protein. You're probably gonna clot. It's not a good thing. So your body and your immune system is actually trained not to do that. So it's actually trained that once it sees a pathogen again, it's gonna make the antibodies again. So it's important for you not to base your entire concept of immunity on just one aspect of immunity, which is the antibody. When you look microscopically and when you look in the medical literature, we see multitude of T cells reacting to SARS-CoV-2 presence, even though the antibody levels may be coming down. So when I see antibody levels going down and I read a paper that shows antibody levels going down, my first response is, did they look at T cells? Did they look at memory T cells? 
Did they look at memory B cells, which remember how to make antibodies? You've heard people say, oh, we're just gonna develop herd immunity and nobody's gonna get infected. Relax. So on August 7th, 2020, we've got 5 million people in the United States that are infected, okay? 160,000 have died, which is about a 3% mortality rate, okay? Do I think the mortality rate of SARS-CoV-2 is actually 3%? No, I don't. Do I think that only 5 million people have the disease? No, I don't. I think it's a lot more. So let's be conservative and say that the mortality rate is like 1%. So if I say the mortality rate is 1%. We've got 330 million people in this country and you want to develop herd immunity, right? That's a lot of people with an infection. So you would take 70% of 330 million people that need to get the infection to develop herd immunity, which is 231 million are infected. We're saying the mortality rate is 1%. We're talking 2.3 million people that are gonna die. So I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm not saying that that's going to happen. I'm just saying that if we took the approach of let everybody get it and we wanna develop herd immunity, that's what we would have to do. So we need therapies like vaccines, like monoclonal antibody therapies, to help us with those numbers. And it's important for us to wear masks, wash our hands, and respect social distance. There's actually an equation for herd immunity. The equation is one minus one over R naught. So you're gonna ask yourself, first of all, what the hell is R naught? Here's what R naught means. R naught is the average number of people who get infected by one person that's infected. Example. Measles, one of the most infectious viruses in the history of the world, has an R naught of 18. That means if I had measles, I'm gonna give it to 18 other people, which is crazy. SARS-CoV-2, when it first came out, had an R naught of about five or six. So the average person was infecting five or six people. The R naught now for SARS-CoV-2 seems to fall in between two and three, but why is that important? For viruses to become extinct, you want that R naught to be less than one. If it doesn't get to less than one, it continues to infect more and more and more, as we're seeing right now, which is why it's important to develop vaccines. Because there are four respiratory coronaviruses that are passed around every year, are those respiratory viruses actually creating immunity to some SARS-CoV-2 patients? The answer is probably so. It probably is creating some immunity. Here's something that's actually freaky, but also really, really cool. There was already a SARS coronavirus epidemic in China in 2003. SARS-CoV-2 is about 80% homologous to SARS-CoV-1. So it has a similar structure. It has similar protein. So not only do you have the proteins that we talk about, the structural proteins, nucleocapsid, membranous, envelope, spike, but they also have non-structural proteins. We've looked at people who are unexposed to SARS-CoV-2, but who have been exposed to either SARS-CoV-1 or other beta coronaviruses. And it looks like they have some T cell immunity to SARS-CoV-2. There are people who 17 years after they had SARS, because it was in 2003, it's now 2020, they still have T cell activity directed at spike protein, nucleocapsid protein. This is proven in the literature, and that's why we're developing therapies based on people who were infected with SARS-CoV-1 in the past. Also, people have been infected with SARS-CoV-2 when you look at monoclonal antibody types of treatment. But when you look at these respiratory viruses and you begin to have an understanding of wait a second, who passes around respiratory viruses a lot? Oh, wow, it's children. Oh, wait, wait a second. Who is not getting as sick as adults? Oh my God, it's children. Does the transmission of the respiratory viruses, which are common between children, actually lead to the child being way more immune than adults are to this infection? It is a question that I have had since the beginning of this illness, and it's a question that I continue to explore. But it's also a question that may answer our future therapies.
Thanks for being here. I really appreciate you guys listening to the immunity of SARS-CoV-2. Having an understanding of herd immunity is extremely important. Please pay attention, subscribe, hit that notification button, and watch the next episode of Medicine Deconstructed. I'm your host, Dr. Jay Ruffin. Thanks again.